5 this morning, Nehemiah chapter 5. And uh, it's always a blessing when Brother Ronnie sings uh, for us, and, and uh, thank you for the choir and, and uh, everybody coming out this morning. So as you turn to Nehemiah chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 1. And it says, There was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. For there were those who said, We, our sons, and our daughters are many. Therefore, let us get grain that we may eat and live. There were also some who said, We have mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. There were also those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as the as their children, and indeed we are forced, forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been bought, brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and our vineyards. And I became very angry, and I heard their outcry in these words. After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and the rulers, and to them each of you is exacting usury from your brother. So I called a great assembly against them, and I said to them, according to the ability we have redeemed our Jewish brethren, who, who were sold to the nations. Now indeed will you even sell your brethren, or should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced and found nothing to say. Then I said, what you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of God because of the reproach of the nations? Our enemies. I also with my brethren and my servants am lending them money and grain. Please let us stop this usury. Restore now to them even this day their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves, their houses, also a hundredth of the money, and the grain, the new wine, the oil that you have charged them. So they said, We will restore it and will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. Then I called the priest and required an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. Then I shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out each man from his house and from his property who does not perform this promise. Even thus may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praise the Lord. Then the people did according to his promise. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah from the 20th year until the, until the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes. Twelve years, neither I nor brothers ate at the governor's provisions. But the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine, besides 40 shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Indeed, I also continued the work on this wall, and we did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there for the work. And at my table were 150 Jews and rulers, besides those who came to us from other nations around us. Now that which was prepared daily was one ox and six choice sheep. Also fowl were prepared before me, and once every ten days an abundance of all kinds of wine, yet... In spite of this, I did not demand the governor's provisions, because the bondage was heavy on this people. Remember me, my God, for goods according to all that I've done for this people. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for, uh, Father, how it speaks to us. And Lord, as we gather in your house today, Father, among your people, Father, called by your name and guided by your Holy Spirit, we, Father, we ask that your that your spirit would speak to us through your book father that we would look at its words and father they would ring deeply into each and every one of us father that we would see our sin that we'd see your righteousness father we'd be led to repent and father that we'd be led to obey father we want to shine your light into this lost world that you've placed us in father all those that we come in contact with father who who hate you who are indifferent to you father who are under the bondage or captivity of demons or evil spirits Father, we want to shine your light. We want to speak your truth. We want to carry your character. And we want to see a harvest of souls to your glory, to your name. And we pray because of the name of Jesus. Amen. 
All right, guys, so here we are in Nehemiah chapter 5, and, and uh, as we open, this is kind of a pivot. So chapter 5 kind of sits in the middle of this uh, building project, of building these walls. So we've seen that the people were led away into Babylonian captivity uh, for generations. We see that now Persia has conquered Babylon. When Persia conquered Babylon, they had a different set of rules. They had a different organization. And so with that, they allowed captured and captive people to go back to their homelands. And one of those was the Jews. The Hebrews were allowed to return to their homeland. And we see three different waves that go. We see Zerubbabel take about 50,000. Then later we see Ezra come with several thousand. And now Nehemiah comes with several thousand more to come in. Each one accomplished something in the rebuilding of this nation, the rebuilding of this city. The first comes in and they establish the altar and they establish the temple. Symbolizing that the basis for any restoration of any nation has to begin with a religious outpouring. It has to begin with repentance. It has to begin with a getting right with God. Next, we see Ezra come in, and Ezra reestablishes a culture and has to teach the people God's word. Ezra had the God's word memorized uh, from copying and translating so many times that here he had it memorized, and he came to reestablish the culture, to tell them this is what we're supposed to be doing. This is who we are after they'd been engulfed in captivity. And even those who, were, who remained in Jerusalem didn't have any leadership. They didn't know what to do. And now Nehemiah comes along, and Nehemiah is commissioned with the building of the walls. So now it's protection. Now it's, it's the, the city gates of what is allowed and what's not allowed, what's proper, what's improper, a defining of who is God's and what is not God's. And so as we have gone through this process and we get to where Nehemiah is building this wall. The people are all doing their own part. They're all doing their own section and some are doing a little and some are doing a little more and some are doing a great big uh, amount. We come to the middle of this building project and chapter 5 is inserted. And it's because something is happening in the middle of this construction project that they waited 140 years to do, and that they're going to accomplish in only 52 days. In the middle of this 52 days, there's a great uproar among the people. There's a great uproar. There's a commotion. There's a, a struggle. There's a, a verging on a riot that's going to take place in Jerusalem. And the purpose is, is because these people are being further oppressed. Now, They've for generations known oppression. Those who were in, in uh, Babylon have grown up under oppression, and they know what it's like to lose their children to slavery, to be, uh, to, for their fruit uh, of their labor to be taken away from them or deprived of them. The ones who remained in Jerusalem had no wall, had no military, had no defense. And so all of the pagan groups were just coming in to the people of God and taking whatever they wanted. They would steal their children and lead them off into slavery. They would wait for them to, to plow the ground, to plant the seeds for the crops to grow and for them to tend to it. And when it was ready for harvest, guess what? In came the enemy to steal the harvest away from God's people. And so they all saw the necessity. They saw that God was behind this project to reestablish his city of praise, his holy people, distinct and different from all other peoples on the face of the planet, that their God was different from all the other gods that all of the other people groups were serving, and they're going to build the wall. And in the middle of building the wall, they run into a huge problem. They don't have anything to eat. They don't have anything to eat. And this is a big problem. Some of us just haven't ate anything yet today, and we are already feeling a big problem. We're already thinking about lunch. We're already thinking about where we're going to go and what we're going to eat. And, and, and some of us are already planning dinner. We had not even ate lunch yet, and we're going to plan dinner. But in the middle of a 52 day building project where people are, are not going to work, they're not going to the fields, they're not harvesting, they're not planting, they're not doing any of these things. They're solely dedicated to building the wall after they've been oppressed for 140 years, after they've been stolen from for 140 years. 
after they've already struggled for 140 years and been robbed and their surplus has continuously been taken away from them, now they go to build the wall and when they go to the grocery store, the prices are just simply way too high. And they're having to borrow money and they're having to sell their vineyards, they're having to mortgage their businesses, they're having to take a mortgage out on their home for pennies on the dollar in order to go and be able to just afford enough to hopefully scrape by these hard times to just simply get through it and get to the other side. And they know that if they finish this project, that there's blessedness, that God's hand is upon it, but there's a struggle. There's a hard time that they find themselves in the middle of. And so all of the oneness and all of the togetherness and all of the, the, the hooray that was going on to get this project accomplished, to, to do what God has called us to do, now was in jeopardy and was in doubt. See, what had happened was that this city had existed and there was enough food and there was enough crops and there was all of this. But over the course of the last several generations, they had had a massive population increase. They'd had a lot of people who immigrated into Jerusalem. I just told you about tens of thousands of them who came with Zerubbabel, who came with Ezra, who now have come with Jeremiah, of these grand pilgrimages that, that have taken place and we don't even know about the smaller pilgrimages. So we have a city now who has grown in population of possibly a hundred thousand people who have influxed into this. And guess what? Vineyards don't get much bigger. The fields don't grow with the population. The enemies are still coming in and stealing the food that is grown upon those, uh, uh, in those fields and upon those vineyards. There's only so many houses within the city. And we know what happens when, when demand goes up and supply goes down, don't we? Something called inflation. We're seeing it today. We're experiencing it today. And so the price of everything suddenly skyrockets. And these people who were barely scraping by, who were barely getting along, now find themselves in a time of severe lack. A, how are we going to make it? How are we going to survive this? And if we can just get to the other side, if we can just get the wall built, if we can just continue in our obedience to God, we know that great things are ahead and we know that great blessedness awaits us. But the struggle is still real. And the struggle still exists. And so the people, while they're doing the work and as they're applying themselves to the wall and each man's doing his own part, they're wondering where their next meal's going to come from. And hunger makes cowards of us all. Wars are fought on full bellies. And so as they are engaged in this, they have this problem of that uh, these other people now are taking away the rest of the blessing. Because they, for generations, have been worried about the enemies on the outside. And what they didn't realize was that there were enemies on the inside. And so seeing this time of lack, of seeing this time of despair, there were those who came along and saw it as an opportunity for their own prosperity. And so instead of contributing, what they do is they try to extract from the people. They try to take from the people. And it says that it was their nobles and it was their rulers who did it. So we've seen that here the uh, uh, increase in population, we have inflation going up. They go and they borrow money. When you borrow money, what happens? What does the bank charge you? Interest. Interest. So you don't just pay back what you borrowed. What do you pay back? A whole lot more, don't you? If you get a mortgage at 6% for 30 years at $100,000, do you know how much money you pay back if you just make your mortgage payments every month? You borrowed $100,000, you pay back $250,000. Now, how many would, would like to have an extra $150,000? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a lot of grain. That's a, that's a whole lot of food. That's a whole lot of automobiles. 
But instead, we mortgage to the healed, and what happens? They exact interest from us. We're not patient. We don't work. We don't plod along. We don't do as good as we can do right now, hoping to do better in the future as we save, as we earn, as we invest. Now, what we have today is, a, is an attitude, a whole culture of, I want it, and I want it now. Even has that old commercial, it's my money and I want it now. That whole thing is built around somebody who can't be patient. They have an award. They have an annuity that's set up. And instead of being patient and getting all of the annuity paid to them over time, instead they take a small percentage of it right now. And so these rulers and these nobles who were supposed to look after the people who had authority and who had responsibility and that they were given uh, that responsibility and that authority to be a minister of good works to the people. Instead, they turn around and see it as an opportunity to enrich themselves on the backs of the people who were building the wall, on the backs of the people who were trying to restore the culture on the backs of the people who are working to make God's city, God's city once again. And so as they have this massive uprising, they have this problem, they're having to mortgage their houses, they're having to sell their businesses, they're, they're having to just scrape by to try to get through, and they're even having to sell their children into slavery. Having to sell their children into slavery just for another meal. Just for another week. Just for another month. And they're giving their children over to the rulers. They're giving their children over to the government. They're giving their children over to the nobles. And they're just handing their children and their development and their future and their lifestyle and their culture. They're handling, handing it all over just so they can make it a little longer. And so they're being robbed from, from the enemies outside. And at the same time, they're being robbed from the enemies on the inside. And on top of the population growth, there's a famine. And on top of the famine, there's also the taxes. Now, if I sneak into your house while you're not there, and I steal from you, what do we call that? That's theft. But now if I come to you on the street and I threaten you with force or I produce a weapon and I make some, some threat directly to you in order to, to steal from you, what is that called? That's called robbery. But now if I steal with you with just simply a pen, what's that called? Taxes. And so with that, now they're being stolen from, from the outside enemy. They're being stolen from, from the inside many, enemy. And at the same time, the government is taking even more from them. In the middle of all of this problem, in the middle of all of this work that's being done, it seems like on every side, they're being taken advantage of. Their elected officials, their governors, their, their, their uh, celebrities are stealing from them. The marketplace is stealing from them. The government is stealing from them. And with that, they find themselves lacking. They find themselves not able to do what needs to be done. They see their children being given over to this thing. And man, they cry out. And they come to Nehemiah, who seems to be the only guy with a plan. The only guy who's not trying to steal from them. The only guy who's not trying to take advantage of them. And they come to Nehemiah and they cry out to Nehemiah. And they said, look at what's going on. We're losing our income. We're losing our businesses. We're losing our crops. We're losing our families. We're losing everything, Nehemiah. And he diagnoses the problem really quick. He diagnoses the problem really quick and he goes to the nobles and he goes to the authorities and he goes to the rulers and he just flat calls them out on it he calls a general assembly and he points out and he says man look at the situation we're in look at the the pivotal moment in history where we find ourselves look that it's been 
140 years of destitution here, and we're only a matter of days and weeks from making it all better. And man, you can't even get your hand out of other people's pockets for just two months so that we can have a brighter future and a better day. You'd rather take their children from them while they're working for a better future for those children. And so he calls them out and he says, listen, you need to return everything. He says, even you return the vineyards, you return the crops, you return the houses, you return everything. And it even says a hundredth of the money. He's literally talking about the interest rate. He just didn't tell them to give them back the money that or to cancel the debt. He said, no, nah, just quit charging the interest on the debt. Let them repay you. But don't charge interest when we're in this hard time. Don't take advantage of a difficult situation. And so with that, what it is is that Nehemiah sees that in the middle of what's going on and in the middle of what God's doing, in the middle of what God is bringing about, that here there are these people who are supposed to be the leaders and instead, man, they're selfish and they're out for their own self. And in that, it's destroying the moral, the morale of the people. Let me tell you, when God gets to doing something, it don't take long before somebody's got something to bicker about. And before somebody wants to cause a problem, and somebody wants to cause strife, and somebody wants to nitpick, and somebody wants to find something to complain about. And let me tell you, uh, complaining is kind of like excuses. If you want to complain about something, you'll always find something to complain about. If you want to find an excuse, if you're an excuse maker, you're always going to find an excuse. How many of y'all uh, have some folks that you just can't take to a restaurant with you? Y'all already know what I'm about to say. And you take them to the restaurant and they sit there and man, they sit in a padded chair and the air conditioning's blowing and it's just nice and, and man, they're not fixing to have to cook a meal. And they got a little server that comes out. And they come out and they say, well, here's what we have and, and uh, how can I help you? What would you like to drink? They go get your favorite drink and put it on the table there. And, and, and man, like you just don't have to do anything. And then they, that you have this whole list of options before you of food that you don't have to cook. That's my favorite kind of food is the food I don't have to cook. <laughs> and so... In the middle of all that, man, that they'll order their favorite dish or, or something they want to eat, and they'll come and they put it before them, and man, all of a sudden the critique starts. And instead of looking at the blessedness of it or, or anything, it's, well, you know, this Coke is too flat, or, or you know, that I ordered Coke and they gave me Dr. Pepper or, or something, or man, this steak is too, it's overcooked, it's undercooked, it's overseasoned, it's, it's overseasoned, it, it's, you know, the vegetables are, are too uh, limp, they're not firm enough oh they're too firm they need to cook them longer oh well this you know they made a banana pudding and 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 they put uh vanilla wafers in it instead of putting this other thing in it and, it, and man it's just critique and it's like why can't we just be happy you fix need a meal you don't have to pay for or you don't have to cook you don't have to prepare you don't have to do anything to it it's like just be happy <laughs> yeah <laughs> Y'all don't point. Don't point. The, uh, the, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I learned a long time ago. And I think a lot of times with that, it's because um, of a lack of our own experience in those endeavors. You know, I've, I've yet to meet a waitress who's a terrible customer. And I've yet to meet somebody who's in customer service and having to deal with the public all day who has to speak to the manager. And it's the people who we pour out on because we don't have that same experience, man. You know, I, I grew up, I've worked in a restaurant several times, worked in a kitchen a few times. And in that, um, hey, if I go and I sit down across the table from you and, and if you order sweet tea, guess what I'm ordering? Sweet tea. Because I know that, that fella, that lady, man, they're trying to remember what everybody in that whole place is drinking. I'm, I want to make it easy on them. There's been times me and Lindsay go out and I order food and they give me the whole wrong plate. You know what I do? Thank God, I'm going to eat this food. 
And so in that, you know, we, we're just, we've gotten to the place, man, we're just not thankful enough. We're just not appreciative enough. You know, we, we want to criticize and we want to uh, find and we want to nitpick in everything in life. And so what happens is what that will do is that breeds just a negativity. It destroys things. It tears things down. In Scripture, we see that the wise woman builds her house up, but that, the, but that the foolish woman tears down her house. You know how she tears it down? With her mouth. With her mouth. And that's why Scripture tells us to be very aware that we don't even allow a root of bitterness to spring up. Because if we get a root, what are we going to have? A plant. Amen. And... and Roots of weeds. Weeds don't grow slow, right? I'm still waiting. Have any of y'all ever planted a blueberry bush? Nobody ever told me that it takes a lifetime to grow a blueberry bush. Like everything else we've planted, you plant it and it's small, man. Every year it just seems like it doubles in size and it gets bigger and fuller and more beautiful. I got blueberry bushes who are, who are uh, four and five years old that are you know, still less than a knee high. You see those big blueberry bushes in somebody's yard? They planted that a long time ago. It was a lot of patience and diligence to get to that place. Man, we don't have that anymore. People don't do things anymore. They, they want instant gratification. They want instant satisfaction. They, they want it now. There's no waiting. And in that also, there's no preparing for tomorrow. There's no thoughtfulness of the next generation of what you're doing in your life. How is that impacting your children? How is how you're raising your children right now impacting your grandchildren who aren't even born yet? And so we've gotten all about what I want today, what I want next week. And even if we are thoughtful and we are planning, we're thoughtful and we're planning in three-year or five-year plan. We need to stop that. We need to get back to a hundred-year plan of that we want this church to be here a hundred years from now. We want our families to be loving and serving God a hundred years from now. And then go, okay, with that goal in mind, what am I going to do today? How am I going to do it today? And let me tell you, friends, when you start to have that viewpoint, and you start to have that outlook of what you're building, what you're establishing, what our goal is, what the, what the end game is all about, you know what it does? It takes your focus from here to here. And instead of just looking at your next step and what's in front of you, instead of making big deals out of little things, all of a sudden, we make big deals out of things that are big deals. We don't even concern ourselves with the little things. Somebody said something. <laughs> People talk all the time. Who cares? Some old foolish person has something bad to say about you. Well, listen, anybody that listens to a dummy, you know what, who, know what they are? A dummy. If some evil person has something bad to say about you, the only people who are going to listen to them are other evil people. Who cares what they think? And we get so torn up and we get so uh, focused on the details, the little things. That, man, we lose sight of the big things. So here they're so focused on making a little bit of money, they forget about what's happening. They forget about the greater good. They forget about the bigger things. They've overcome themselves with the ever-present now. And they've stopped thinking about the future. And they've stopped thinking about where they're headed, what they're doing, and what God has called them to do. So Nehemiah, seeing this, he goes to them and he rebukes them. His righteous anger led him to reasonable actions. So we get mad, right? We get mad pretty often. How many of y'all know that being angry is not a sin? Y'all know that? The Bible says, be ye angry and sin not. Anger in and of itself is not a sin. But you know what is a sin? Is where that anger comes from. Are you angry because of some evil that you see in the world? Is it righteous anger that's springing up from you? Is it a love of God? Is it a love of people? Is it a love of good that, that is driving you to this anger? Or is it just old selfish self driving you to selfish anger? See, anger reveals where your love is. Anger reveals where your love is. 
Because this morning, if I got up here and, and let's say I started talking about college football and, and I started talking about the, the Tennessee Volunteers, and man, they're just so terrible and they're horrible and, and they stink and they ain't, ain't never going to win nothing ever again. How many of y'all mad? No, you know why? You don't care nothing about them. Boy, if I start talking about Alabama or Auburn, Auburn's more realistic. They know they ain't no good. But if I start talking bad about Alabama, then, man, people would be mad. They want to leave the church, be upset. I pastored churches before that, uh, that you didn't want to preach after Alabama lost a game. That was, that was in the late 90s. We lost a lot of them back then. And so with that, you know, if, if Alabama lost the game, half the church didn't show up. They didn't want to talk to nobody. They had to turn TV off and shut the door. They, they didn't want to hear no bad news about Alabama. They allowed their sports teams, they allowed all of this stuff to affect their mood and affect their life, and it was no longer a game. Because why? Because they had an inappropriate affection towards something. They took something that God gave to be a blessing, and they made it an idol instead. So often, we will take our righteous anger, righteous anger, and if we use it rightfully, we can do a great amount of good with it. But we can't get righteously anger, angry and act unrighteously with it. So look what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah took his righteous anger and he went directly to the problem and he challenged the problem directly. And he said, this is wrong. This is improper. Look at what you're doing. Man, we just came out of slavery. Our whole nation was enslaved for generations, for the second time. And here we are, we're coming back and we're trying to reestablish and we're trying to rebuild and we're trying to revive. And you would sell your, the children into slavery? You would enslave your own people after God has set you free from the lost world around you? And man, he challenges them directly towards righteous, reasonable actions. But then Nehemiah was no hypocrite either. So Nehemiah wasn't just simply harping upon what somebody else was doing while he himself was living contrary to it. If he was going to get on the, the case of the leaders and the nobles for being self-interested, of exacting usury from God's people, from lending to their fellow Christians uh, and exacting interest from it, he wouldn't be able to live off of the king's taxes either. So he didn't receive his salary the whole time. He didn't tariff the people. And when he goes to those who were wrong and those who were in error, he had to make sure he was right first. That they couldn't say, well, this is no different than what you're doing. And so he says, in his rebuke of them, he says, listen, I've been here for 12 years. And in 12 years, I didn't take a dime. In 12 years, I didn't tax at all. In fact, we gave away freely, and man, everything that I had and anything that we could, man, we had 150 people sitting at my dinner table. How many of y'all can foot that grocery bill? And he said, I had 150 people that I allowed to sit at my dinner table. We were having to kill a cow and six sheep every day just to feed them. He said, and even in the process of this temporary lack, of this temporary, uh, you know, giving over, he said, I didn't ever think about me. See, so often we have a me focus and an I and a me and a we, and we never think about others. And it's I before y'all, no matter what. Me and Chris were joking this morning about uh, about you know the Corinthian church and how the Corinthian church when they would absorb the uh, observe the Lord's Supper that the people in the front of the line that they were eating all the bread and getting drunk on the wine and then the people at the end of the end of the uh, the line didn't have nothing to eat. I told them said that's funny. Two thousand years ain't nothing changed. And, and I mean, that's just human nature of how it is, even among the people of God, man, that will walk into God's house and instead of it being God-focused, instead of how can I bless God, how can I minister to my fellow Christians, we'll walk in and we'll go, what do you got for me? How are y'all going to make me happy? What can you do to please me? And so the things that we see is, first off, is that internal evils are 
often more dangerous than external evils. That man, having sin in the camp and having a wrong attitude of having negativity, constant criticism, constant bickering, to have to pick a fight with somebody just so I got something to entertain myself with. Fighting with people who don't even know that, that I'm fighting with them. I'm mad at so-and-so, ain't talked to him in six years. He don't even know I'm mad at him. What kind of foolishness is that? But you see, friends, it's easy for us to rally together because we see an enemy on the outside. But it's a whole lot different for us to take an internal uh, inventory of our own life and go, am I being an enemy on the inside? Am I pushing people away from Christ? Am I pushing people away because of my bitter, my enviness, my my bad attitude, man, just my my grouchiness and my sour disposition? Am I doing something from within to jeopardize the work that God is doing in our presence? Internal evils are more dangerous than external evils. Do y'all know why abortion is still legal? Because there's too much money to be made off of it. And there's too much money on both sides. The medical community and the abortion doctors, they want to make money killing babies. They don't care that they're having to kill babies to make money. They're okay with it because they're making money. But then at the same time, we've got the pro-life movement. And you know what? The one thing that the pro-life movement doesn't want is to abolish abortion. Because you know if abortion was illegal across our entire nation today, you know what would happen to those pro-life people? They'd be out of a job. And that's why they want to just play around with it. And they want to tinker with it. And they want it to remain an issue so that they can profit off of it. We had our very own Southern Baptist Convention. What we call the Ethics and Religious Liberties Council. And their their leader sided with the same side as Planned Parenthood to petition against the state of Louisiana because they were fixing to put in a ban on abortion. Why would he do that? Because if abortion's banned, he ain't got a job no more. All of these groups that fundraise and they say, oh, let's end abortion, let's end abortion, let's end abortion. Most of them don't want to end abortion. You know why? They make too much money with it. So we're not pro-life, we're anti-abortion. We want it stopped. There's no reason for it. There's no logic behind it. It's just pure evil and people profiteer off of it. And we see that in so many different ways, even with civil rights and, and all, man. We, we, you know, we were closer to racial harmony and every time the nation starts to heal and starts to put itself together, man, they got to come along and stir up some kind of junk to make people fight against each other. You know why? Because if there is racial harmony, then the race baiters don't make no money. Internal evils are more dangerous than external evils. And the problem that we're facing in our nation and the problem that we're facing in our nation, nation's churches are not because of enemies outside the church, but rather it's because of enemies inside of the church. People who are just there to profiteer. People who are just there for entertainment. People who are just there for themselves and not for the glory of of God. Secondly, we see that we should pray for our leaders. If God gives us righteous leaders, we should pray for them diligently. And if God gives us evil leaders, then we should pray for them even more diligently. Every king that Israel ever had was either a king that they needed or a king that they deserved. And the same in our nation's history, every president was either a president we needed or a president we deserved. And in that, if God gives us a a righteous man to lead, then God knew we needed that righteous man. And if God gives us evil men to lead, then we deserve those evil men. We should pray for our leaders. We should pray for them. Sometimes we should pray against them. We should pray that God changes hearts, that God leads them in the right direction. We should pray diligently for all of our leaders from our local city leaders to our civic leaders to our our state leaders and even to our national leaders. Very often a righteous leader is having to fight two fronts. He's having to fight the good guys and the bad guys all at the same time. We should pray for our pastors. Man, Op has a great bunch of pastors. This is probably the strongest group of pastors I've ever seen in a city before. But in that, man, they face it every 
day. There are, there are hundreds of pastors who leave the ministry every month. Don't come back. And in that, thirdly, we should see that righteous anger should lead us to reasonable actions. And we should love God and we should love men enough that we hate evil, and that we hate sin. And our hatred of sin should start inside of our own selves. It should start with our own sin. And we should repent of it diligently, earnestly. We should search our hearts every day. We should pray, Lord, every morning, Lord, what is it in my life? Lord, where am I wrong? Lord, what have I done? Lord, what thought, what attitude, what action am I committing that's making other people drive further away from you, Father? That, that's separating me from you, Lord. Just reveal it to me, Lord. Allow me this repentance. And in that, we'll see our families change, and in that we'll see our leadership change, and in that we'll see our outlook change, and in that we'll see grand revival when revival starts with you, with your home, with how you raise your sons and daughters, with the example that you set, with the culture that you make in your home, with the choices that you make every day. That's where nations change is in homes. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word, Father, as real and relevant as it is, Father, that it speaks to us uh, down through the ages, Father, always to convict us, always to challenge us, Father, but that it's always applicable and it's always there, Father. Lord, we pray that we would repent, that we would, would turn from our own wickedness, Father, that we would lead righteously in every endeavor of life, Father, that we would take up our sword and our travel, we do our part, Father, to build your holy city. Father, that we would be about the work of your kingdom. And Father, that we wouldn't be about ourselves. That we would be people who do the work, not people who complain about the workers. And Father, that in everything that we say and everything that we do, Father, that your name would be glorified. And that your kingdom would be advanced. Father, we thank you, we praise you, we love you, and we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.